Greetings, David Arendelle here, bringing you early results of a research study conducted by Amanda Haney and I with the facilitators here at the University of Minnesota. This uh, manuscript is still being completed, more work to be done on it, but we have enough information we'd like to be able to share some of our early findings about what is going on with the facilitators within our program. And this one we call Professional Identity Development. So this one will be a much shorter uh, overview since we still have more work to do. But we were trying to figure out why was it that our facilitators kept calling themselves teachers, even though during training workshops were very explicit about how you're a facilitator, how that role is different from that of a teacher, and all the rest. And this has gone on for decades. And there's never been a really very clear reason why they just kind of said, well, this is kind of a shorthand or, or whatever. Well, we actually found out there's something much more deep inside of it in terms of how they think about themselves. So since this was a grounded study, we didn't go in with any presupposition that there is uh, leadership identity development or in terms of developing a professional identity, uh, acting beyond the job description to serve as a facilitator. We had no clue about that. But whenever we uh, conducted our rigorous qualitative study and used triangulated data, we began to find out that the facilitators saw themselves differently. So we were uh, trying to find some sort of a theoretical model that helped explain to us why were they behaving the way they did. And we ran across this one here in the professional literature. And in this one, they were trying to make a sense out of how do novice teachers, secondary teachers, how do they behave differently than more experienced teachers? And in their particular study, they found out that teachers live within these three poles of this being a subject matter expert, humanistic, which means that they understand their students, understand individual needs, uh, make adaptations uh, to the lesson plans in order to facilitate learning for all the students inside the class. Very, very uh, focused on making an inclusive learning environment. And then also facilitated learning, which was, well, the teacher, the experienced ones, well, they're not going to be dispensing information to the students. Rather, they're going to use their knowledge of the students, this humanistic skill set, and they're going to be using facilitated learning, which means they're going to be setting up a learning environment for the students uh, to teach themselves. So lots of simulations, lots of project work, and all the rest. And this is where the experienced teachers hung out, was in this zone down here. And what they found with new teachers, these are teachers just freshly minted out of a college of education somewhere, highly skilled, very knowledgeable, but they kind of limited themselves of being a subject matter specialist. They really didn't know the students very well, and they really didn't use very much in the way of facilitated learning. So they kind of all operated somewhere in this portion of the diagram. The more experienced teachers, well, they can kind of tended to uh, operate much further down here. They were much more interested in students teaching themselves rather than trying to directly teach the students. I suppose in a somewhat um, candid way of looking at the subject matter, matter expert, it's really kind of similar to the banking concept by Ferrari in which teachers think that their mission is to deposit information into the minds of the students. And that from his point of view and many other educators since his book came out probably what 40 years ago maybe it's now 50th anniversary this banking concept has been seen as destructive for many, many other reasons. We could spend a number of YouTube videos exploring that. The point, though, is why is it that we uh, were drawn to this particular model? 
because based off of the behaviors of the students, the facilitators, based off of the uh, journals that they completed, based off of their responses to uh, extensive surveys and small group um, interactions, well, the facilitators, they actually hung out down on this side of the diagram and were not up at the top then. They saw themselves as being different. We always thought that they would be hanging out up here as subject matter experts. Now, we went and supervised the sessions. We saw that they were bringing in facilitation. That was a critical skill um, that we trained them during the um, initial training workshops and stuff. But we thought that they would probably be over, I know this is really messy on the diagram, they'd be hanging out a little bit more over here, somewhere between being a subject matter expert and a facilitator. What we found out was that actually they hung out a lot more between being humanistic, deeply understanding their students and their needs, and being a facilitator. Well, that actually led to some insights for us and these are some of the very preliminary themes which we have seen emerge some of these themes may end up falling out simply because there's not enough agreement among the facilitators you don't have a theme just because out of 44 uh, subjects that only one believes something that's not appropriate but what we found out was that these are the things that were repeat themes among the facilitators. They were confused. What were they supposed to do whenever people needed information that was necessary? We trained them very intensely about don't take on the role of professor. Do not lecture to students. They've already had one lecture. They don't need another one. Also, there's a power issue there. Uh, faculty members don't like to think that other people are interpreting their classes as so difficult that they have to actually re-lecture the material again to the students. And the fear is that they would go and cause for the peer learning program to be discontinued. Well, this left kind of a real frustration or confusion facilitators because sometimes the students come in and they're just sincerely confused. They don't understand really what happened in the class session. It isn't a disparaging comment about the teacher. It isn't an indictment of themselves. It's just sometimes they just don't understand. So what we found out was that they had a lot of guilt whenever sometimes they would actually go and do some micro-teaching. They might go and take three minutes, four minutes, maybe five minutes at the most, one time during the review session in order to reteach the material again. But they had a lot of guilt about that, and because of that, they actually were never telling us as supervisors and mentors and coaches for the program. They felt really bad about that. One of the things that we discovered here is that the facilitators are much more complex than their job description. You know, the job description goes on for probably three quarters of a page. They saw themselves, the facilitators, because they had this humanistic um, component where they understood what students needed. I think also part of what will come out of the manuscript is about how, well, they're nearly the same age. And in some cases, they might be a year younger than other students in the review session. They know what the students need. And sometimes they would go and break the rules in order to give them what they needed. They saw themselves differently over the course of the academic term. This was not something immediate. They tried to follow the protocols that were given to them at the beginning of the academic term. They were very dutiful and supportive. But as the semester went on, they began to see that they had to make some modifications. In a sense, let me just back back up here for a second. Sorry for all the mess. They kind of started off somewhere up here in the academic term, and they kept moving further and further down to the humanistic and the facilitated side. So for them, they understood what it is the students needed. 
They sometimes would, as I said earlier at the beginning, they would call themselves teachers or teaching assistants. It always seemed so odd to us why they did that. Well, finally, they began to tell us. And it was a real shocker for me. I've worked with programs for 30 years. And the students told us they were really afraid to tell us what they were doing. In fact, some of them actually expressed feelings of shame that they were letting us down. Wow. What are the implications out of this? Well, moving away from just simply asking facilitators to follow a detailed job description, understanding that they have a more professional way of looking at themselves. Exposing them to this model that we saw here a little bit earlier and helping to have some open discussions about this during the initial training workshop and also throughout the academic term maybe using some of this for some of their weekly journal entries. And this is one of the most controversial ones here. Endorse appropriate use of direct instruction and develop training materials to help them to practice this. Either we can just let them do this by themselves through trial and error, or we can actually recognize this is something that needs to be done. Now, we can't let them actually go and become full teachers. That's not what is needed. But you know what? We can actually talk to them in terms of how do you do a short-term explain during the uh, session. That may seem terribly simple to many of you who are listening to this, but it goes against some of the big protocols that you'll see inside some of the major uh, programs. In fact, I'm familiar with one that operates over in England and in which in that case prohibited answering of any question by a student during a review session. Boy, is that a really harsh reason. There's all kinds of political things into that, but for this short YouTube video, we really can't explore them all. But we can actually say it's okay to do explaining. But let's just go ahead and explain explore that and practice that during the training session then. And then once again, continue to talk to them about how they are developing their professional identity. Now, this is different than vocational identity development. Vocational identity development is what their future, future career is going to be. In this case, their professional identity is what they are at that moment. They're not saying they're going to become teachers, but they're saying that they are a professional and they're using judgment to do what is in the best interest of the students. So much more we could talk about. This manuscript still has more work to do with that. You can find some other information that might be useful. I've talked about how, obviously, our YouTube page, the podcast, obviously going to the resource page that I maintain, taking a look at the bibliography with 1,400 plus articles. I'll have to share with you, you don't find much of anything discussed in any of the literature about professional identity development. That is not something that has been covered well, and I hope that other institutions and other researchers can take what it is that we've done and do their own studies to see whether we were correct in our observations. I would love to visit with you on the phone, obviously the website, and then also on the email. This is really exciting for me. After working with programs for 30 years, I'm still learning new things. And that's what I really find exciting about all of this. And I hope that I can have conversation with you with what you're learning too. Thanks for listening.